And as I dug into it, the story of St. Patrick is actually the story of someone who chased the snakes out of Ireland. And you start getting into that and you're like, what does he mean? What does this mean by chasing the snakes out of Ireland? Like, what is this actually about? And the more you dig, the more you realize that chasing the snakes out of Ireland was literally the victory of Christianity over the pagans. It was the destruction of the dragon peoples and the peoples that were the keepers of the ancient wisdom of the Irish, which is why no one understands what Irish is. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to today's amazing episode of First Contact. I have a very special guest here. Some of you may recognize his face. This is Adam Apollo. Now, Adam and I met recently in America at Contact in the Desert. And when I heard his story, went running up to him afterwards and said, Adam, you got to be on First Contact. We've got to have you on the show. So here we are today. And Adam he is the CEO of Super Luminal Systems and also has an amazing network called Unify, which a lot of you may be familiar with. So thank you and welcome to the show, Adam. Thanks so much, Isha. It's a pleasure to be here with you today and uh, glad to meet your audience and have an adventure together this evening or this morning, depending on where you are. <laughs> and adventure is definitely the right word. You've got a beautiful stargate behind you, which is an um, introduction to, I think, the topic that we're going into now. We are just going to dive straight in, Adam, because I want to get to the real juicy parts of some of your story. Now, you have actually met a being. Tell us about that. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's a long story to tell. And for those of you that want the full deep dive, you can go to my website, adamapollo.com, go to the videos and media section, and you'll see links to the episodes on Gaia, where I tell that series and that story in its fullest depth. But essentially, you know, I'd been through a lot of major life transitions leading into that, where I helped to organize a prayer run for world peace across the country, where I was a part of a group of runners from the East Coast and meeting with a group of runners led by my friend Allison Fast from the West Coast with runners from the North and Canada and runners from the South led by my friend Tuva coming up from Mexico. And these runners from the four corners of Turtle Island, as uh, the Lakota call North America, converged in the Black Hills of South Dakota for the 10th annual World Peace Prayer Day ceremonies. And that experience running across the country, carrying an eagle staff, you know, running 10 miles plus a day with a group of other kids, you know, 10 to 15 of us at different times covering over 100 miles a day was a grueling physical experience as well as mental and emotional experience for me in a way that I think really forged me and prepared me for a greater state of openness and groundedness in the way that I was to experience my spirituality and my connection with the world. And so as, as inevitably, I ended up in the middle of the desert in northern Nevada, and I ended up completing a series of very profound and deep healing experiences that led me through meeting my mother and my father from another lifetime in the age of Atlantis. And I came to know that that was my first lifetime incarnating here on this planet and realized that I'm not from this world and actually came here with my sister from the Syrian star system, who was my partner and beloved for four and a half years when I was in college between the years of 2000 and 2004. And um, this big experience happening in 2005, essentially going through those healings and working through all of the stuff that I needed to work through positioned me into the right place and the right time and the right state to have an extraterrestrial ambassador come down and meet me in person in the middle of the desert. Wow. So who is this being? Well, she's part of a group that they call the Tiara Danan. And the Tiara Danan is a species who many of them are kind of hybrid, connected races from different species and different cultures. 
This woman was a combination of Syrian and Shihali and reptilian bloodline so that she had essentially, you know, bone points coming out and a different position for where the side of her eyebrow was. It goes back to about here. But I didn't know anything about that at the time. And I still, to this day, don't know if I could perfectly identify her genetics because doing so is actually quite challenging. I see that a lot of the channelers and researchers who try to share about galactic species, for the most part, they're practically making things up or projecting ideas based on their own you know, perception of what is alien and what alien is supposed to look like. I mean, even the show Deep Space on Gaia that I'm a part of as I'm talking about some of these different galactic cultures, they're showing visuals of these species that don't match at all the way that they looked and the way that I experienced them. And so, you know, assessing genetics is challenging. And my particular path towards doing that became more about understanding the planet, its biosphere, the qualities of skin and bone structure that would, of course, lead to the development of a species in a particular way. And her, this woman, you know, you could have probably had her show up almost anywhere. And if she was cloaked just right or had the right kind of depth of hood on, you would probably just think it was another person walking by. But she had more pointed ears. And again, that eyebrow bone was not in this position, but further back here. So every homo sapien that you meet in your life, every human you meet, you'll always be able to tell this eyebrow bone ridge. It's a very, very like formative aspect of us as a species. And to not have that bone in that position is instantly a sign that you're not dealing with a human because bone points on her forehead and cheeks and chin, these, these kinds of things could have been fakes. You could do that with makeup, for example. But the other thing about her was her telepathic ability. Whenever I was within five feet of her or so, it was as if somebody dropped a VR headset on my head and I was immediately extraordinarily powerfully immersed in her telepathic field and her presence. So her communication was unlike anything I've ever witnessed in my life. It was direct, visceral, visual, audible, extraordinarily powerful. Do you think humans have that capability to communicate in that way as well? I do. I think we all have that latent ability and that we may have had some experiences perhaps of levels of that kind of lucidity. I know probably from different kinds of medicine journeys or initiation experiences, high spiritual states being accessed where you begin to realize how powerful your mental body is and your ability to send information as well as receive information, whether that's visions or memories from the past or from the future. I think we all have different levels of capacity with that. And it's clear that just by training that capacity, just by developing and strengthening that skill, you can be much more proficient at it. And that can come through the way you tell a story or describe a thing or write something down. Someone may be able to have a much clearer visual and sort of tactile experience of what you're expressing, depending on how well you've refined that skill. It's just not a skill that we recognize as part of our day-to-day -day life and our journey of education in this world. Whereas for other worlds that have species and cultures who are interplanetary and regularly need to communicate faster than light to other worlds, i.e. super luminally, which is the name of my company, faster than light means you have to develop the consciousness capacities to manage that communication. And a lot of that is happening because of their skill development on what we call the astral plane. And the astral plane is where people do things like remote viewing and astral travel is sort of a common frame or term that we use these days to think about this. And yet, you know, this is completely outside of the mainstream modern culture in our planet here now. Whereas, you know, within certain metaphysical traditions, these kinds of practices were very, very highly regarded as natural parts of the initiation cycle 
of getting to know your being, your bodies, energetic bodies, and your capacity as a conscious being to enlighten yourself and become more aware of all that you are. I will say I've had some experiences with specific people where I do get stronger telepathic messages. And Mm -hmm. you can relate to this. I know others who are listening and watching can probably relate to this as well. I always Mm -hmm. thought that was normal. So we can communicate. I'm projecting images as I do it. It took me until I was in my 20s to realize Mm -hmm. people weren't actually picking up what I was putting down. And -hmm. then I discovered a few people in my life who were able to do that. And after having conversations and realizing that it's not an everyone thing, it's a me thing and maybe a few other people thing. I think it is a galactic thing, but maybe a lot of other star seeds are experiencing that as well and recognizing that, you know, while a lot of humans communicate verbally and through nonverbals as well, the telepathic component is pretty much ignored. Whereas for those of us who are naturally more telepathic, Mm -hmm. it's frustrating to communicate because we Mm -hmm. think that people are receiving it, but they're not. So I think that's something, you know, that we could probably talk about as well. And just as a, as a curiosity, I've wondered if children who have been diagnosed with autism, mm-hmm. ADHD, other types of things, maybe some of those children might be communicating in these other ways. Do you know anything about that? Yeah, I would absolutely agree with that assessment. I happen to have gone to college and shared a dorm room with a gentleman who had paranoid schizophrenia. And this individual was heavily drugged enough to kind of go to college and be a normal guy, so to speak. But when I started, you know, becoming friends with him, I was in this psychology class and I was looking at the kinds of things they were describing as the seeds for this, for schizophrenia and what it's all about. And I started to ask him questions about it. You know, what is it that you see? What it, What is it that that's happening when this is going on? And he started to describe some of the things he'd see around people, you know, these large blobby T-like white shapes around certain people, and those people would be kind of sick. And he was afraid of a lot of these things that he'd seen. But when he described them to me, like this blob T-shaped thing, I immediately saw that what he was describing were T-cells, which are immune cells, which are fighting off an illness in someone who is sick. And I gave that to him and he was like, oh my God, you're right. That was, they're totally like T cells. I'm going to look that up online. And like, and he did. And I helped him to translate several other things that he had seen on a regular basis. And he started to really wonder if what he was seeing were in fact, just psychic abilities and not just, you know, some sort of delusions or some sort of thing that he was projecting out into the world. Now, I also had had hints that maybe he had these kinds of very powerful psychic capacities because when we would sit on the quad at UNCA, this is uh, University of North Carolina in Asheville, there's this big grassy field in the middle of a lot of the buildings in the center of campus. And we would sit there and he would, in a matter of a minute, he would just look down and he'd pull out... 10 four leaf clovers, sometimes a five leaf clover and a six leaf clover in a matter of a minute, just pulling them out. Like, and I'm looking and I can't see them at all. I don't know how he's seeing them. And he's like, yeah, no, they just pop out to me. And so I became very fascinated with the idea that maybe a lot of our mental issues that we project on people and say that they're they're mentally disturbed or they have these different mental problems is actually because their mental capacities don't fit within the construct of our current society. Whereas for indigenous cultures and peoples, for someone like this gentleman in my college, he would have probably been seen as a seer. You know, he would have been revered as a magi and given the right initiations to support him in managing his own visions and not be afraid of them. Whereas for him, he tells his parents and they're terrified and they're like, that's not real. Put him on drugs, you know, and and lock him down. And so I think that autistic kids for sure have immense gifts. There's an incredible video of a gentleman who took a hot air balloon up into the air once, looked down at the city and sat down in the hot air balloon. And when they brought him back down, he drew a, such a detailed illustration of the entire city on an eight foot wide white piece of paper by you know four feet tall 
And he drew every single detail to the point that it's so exact, you can pull up Google Maps next to it or Google Earth, and you can literally see all of the structures. And he got it in a second just by looking at that city. So we have superpowers as a being, as beings, as a species, but a lot of them have been sort of conditioned out of us, trained at, that they're not okay, or they're not safe, or they're not good. I mean, literally looking at Europe, you have all of the psychic women and powerful beings who, you know, are druids or were from the traditions, the earth traditions that communicated with nature that had the ability to control weather and communicate to the land, all of that being made evil and the devil, you know, by Christianity and the Roman Empire spreading across Europe, murdering everywhere they went, as far as anyone that had these kinds of capacities. And you have plenty of stories of people inside of the Roman Empire or inside of Christianity who explored and realized these aspects of their psyche and their connection who had to keep it secret. You know, for example, Isaac Newton, who's famous for discovering gravity, so to speak, right? Well, most people don't know this, but Newton was actually secretly an alchemist and he was secretly studying the awakening of consciousness, but he had to keep that completely secret because otherwise he would have been killed by the church at the time. So you can see this in the longevity of how we got to here why these things are so blocked out. I mean, we laugh about cancel culture now, but the reality is that that's been around a long time. And that kind of behavior of shutting someone down and telling them that they're wrong or they're evil or their way of thinking is bad is actually the source of so much genocide on the earth for you know the last several thousand years. So I'm curious, you know, a lot of people these days, especially kids coming through, you hear about the indigo children, the rainbow children, the crystal children, star seas, all of that is sort of out mm -hmm. there quite a bit now in the media. Yeah. And uh, do you think that the people coming through now have an actual different genetic structure to, say, people that were born 60, 70 years ago? Well, to address that, we have to actually look at what is going on in our genetics. I think that based on what we've come to understand now in mainstream genetics, it's clear that there is only a very small amount of our DNA that is understood to be the ancestral imprint from your mother line and your father line. Very small. In fact, Dr. Sonia Contrera is known as saying 98% of our DNA is a mystery. Only 2% is the coding proteins that we're basing our understanding of genetics on. So what's going on with the other 98%? A lot of that DNA was called for a very long time junk DNA. And then we realized, well, that's kind of ridiculous. It's definitely not junk because it's turning on and off genes and epigenetics. You can literally change a small factor of an environment. Some parts of that DNA shift, new proteins are coded, and suddenly you know, an animal, a mouse changes color for generations simply because of one epigenetic change. And this is the reason why I was a heavily outspoken advisor and speaker for BioVision 2020. This was long, long time ago. It was like 15, 20 years ago now that I was doing that work to talk about the fact that our genetic modifications of fruits and vegetables were lacking a comprehensive understanding of the genome. If you just are editing one clip here or one clip there without understanding the full genome of something, then you can have a lot of problems and a lot of side effects. And I think we're very much seeing those side effects in the health of humanity now. We're seeing those side effects in especially areas around birth rates and fertility rates. And you think about it, well, if you program out of food its ability to replicate itself or to gestate seeds, i.e. to be fertile, if you kill the ability in the food that you eat, you don't think that's going to have some effect on the body that's eating that food as an information structure? Because it's all information, right? So to take it a little further, we could say that perhaps... There's another source of genetic information that we're carrying. 
And it is my belief and my postulation and theory in science around this that we're actually also carrying with us a soul genome, a genome that's specific to our souls and who we are coming through time, which is why we can have children that look vastly different from their parents because they will literally turn on and off different epigenetic gene codes based on this soul genome they're bringing with them in order to move past or move beyond the genetic stream as it was so far from the parents to children. And I think that right now we have a lot of new star seeds coming into the planet, people from other worlds being born as humans, and the genetic changes that occur when that happens are profound. In fact, they're the reason I believe we have as diverse a racial structure in humanity as we do. It's not just because, you know, some tall, beautiful, you know, dark, bluish, black skinned Nigerian guy's ancestors were in the sun longer than my ancestors in the, you know, cloudy areas of the of Ireland. That is not really what's going to define his entire body's genetics versus mine. I don't think that, that that's solved. And most biologists agree with me that that is not a solved puzzle, how we got as diverse we, as we are. And it's my assessment that the reason we're this diverse is because many, many different star races have been incarnating here into humanity for a very long time. And whether by hybridization, i.e. the stories of the gods coming down and mating with the humans and having, you know, these demigod offspring, right? And then there's all of these lines of genetics and stuff that come from that, whether just hybridization or the simple fact of new genetic information coming through the incarnation of a soul into a, a species I think that there's a lot of evidence that suggests that we as humanity are really a melting pot of species from around the galaxy and that we're actually dealing not with extraterrestrial aliens at all, but that we're dealing with our own star family, our genetic and our galactic family. I love that. And there's a lot of questions I could ask. The one that I really want to get into is the distinction you made between the physical DNA and what you call the soul genome, right? Mm, yeah. I, if either of those things are able to physically impact the body, the way that we look, the abilities that we have, how yeah. would you know if what you're experiencing right now is more based on a physical lineage or if it's more of that soul genome coming through? Well, I would say that, you know, the patterns in our ancestry are best tracked by looking at the experiences that our ancestors have actually been through. And so if you understand the story of your grandfather and his father, you know, or, or your grandmother and her, and her mother, and you know where your ancestors came from and where they lived, if you've done any of that kind of heritage work to understand the challenges that your ancestors faced in whichever country they're from, you know, and in my case, I've tracked that lineage back pretty far, all the way back to where my birth last name, Walsh, was actually also Wallace. Wallace and Walsh were the same family. And both of those names came from the old kind of ancient Gaelic or Irish Volok. And Volok is essentially a, a term that is often used in referring to whales, i.e., Wales becomes Walsh, becomes Welsh, becomes Wallace, is all the same root. And that reference actually is connected to the dragon, which is the, the Welsh flag of the dragon on green is deeply, of course, a symbol recognition of some of that ancient meaning. And it's really fascinating to be someone who's dug into their own history that much and who knows their ancestors. And my dad's visited a bunch of our long distance cousins across Ireland, you know, and tracked their journey on the land and all the things that have happened and found overlaps with our Wallace brethren and brothers and sisters. And our, you know, the history of what we went through was pretty clear. It was a lot of farmers and the English came over and they wanted to take our land and they wanted to rape and pillage. And eventually my 
farmer ancestors were like, you know, screw you guys. Like, this is not going to work. And they raised an army up, burned down the English landlords' houses. And then the English came in to try to slaughter them. But by that time, the Walsh spread out. They merged and flowed and had babies all over, you know, Ireland and the UK, which is why there's lots of Walshes. A bunch of them, you know, came over here to the United States. And it's a clear and historical narrative. And there's lots of data to back it. And so when I see things like, just as a side mention, I see things often in our community around stories of Tartaria, for example, that there was some super advanced civilization in the 1800s and 1700s, you know, that was like capturing energy from the ether and all the buildings are these super advanced, sophisticated technologies and that our entire history is false. It's kind of a personal affront to anyone who's actually done work on their history, because when you come to understand why we are where we are, you realize that, you know, the millions to billions and billions of books, by the way, that were written by people throughout all of these time periods are not constructed lies put in a library to make you to deceive you about our past. Now, that being said, we do have a true part of our ancient past, which has been forgotten. And that's the part of history before all of the civilization history that we know about. It's where a lot of the advanced mathematics and technologies and knowledge came from in ancient Egypt and in Sumeria that actually originates long before that, prior to the end of the last ice age, the age that we call Atlantis properly, you know, popularly. And there is a ton of evidence that that exists. So if you're if you're looking at questioning history and wondering where you've been lied to or where certain things have been left out, well, look a lot further. Don't get caught up in the Tartarian stories because frankly, I've been to a lot of the buildings and a lot of the sites that they claim are these advanced buildings from the 17 and 1800s. And they literally have record, the families literally live right down the road from them in Buffalo, New York, for example. And you can meet the families of the people who built the building. And, you know, it's just that architecture was one of the most advanced expressions of technology for a very long time. And we moved into an industrialized era where it became more important to keep costs down than to build really fantastic, amazing buildings. And so that's why our buildings are so much more crappy now than they were before. It's just a matter of cost. Back then, it was like where you wanted all your money to go was into the architecture of your bank, you know, or of your, you know, city hall building or your post office. You know, these things were revered as a form of art. And we lost a lot of that sense of art. So I know I covered a few different topics there, but I think in our community, especially with as much as the sort of Tartarian story is gaining a lot of viral traction. I think it's important to point out that there are some significant holes in that theory. And that being said, that it's totally true that cultures around the world, especially in a lot of the most ancient and sacred sites, absolutely understood that the energy of the universe is a flowing electrical charge. And you can build temples and build sites to capture that energy. That's a piece that's absolutely true and factual. It's just getting distorted in a bunch of other mess, just like, you know, the people who believe the earth is flat, kind of distorting all the facts based on one piece of disinformation, really one concept that, you know, forces you to believe that everyone in the world is lying to you. And that is that is an ultimately a source of major division on this planet. And I'm very concerned about it, as well as many of my galactic friends out there. I can see that you're very passionate about it. And um, yeah, I think it, it's another fear-based thing, you know, that whole thing of everyone's out to get us, whether it's the government, the cabal, or, you know, there's always someone to blame. There's always someone out there. It's just, I don't get too into those rabbit holes, to be honest. So, um, right. And also because I think once you're tapped in, you can discern truth very easily. It's very easy to know what's true, what's not, you know, so... Yeah. That's kind of where I get my information. But you mentioned your your dragon family, and mm. that's something I do want to get into because what you've just said here is you've actually traced it back through your lineage 
as well as I know from the conversations we had in America when I was traveling, I heard your story a little bit about the the dragon from the galactic side of things as well. So help me piece that together. Where does it all yeah. click into place? Yeah, well, you know, there's stories about dragons all over the world, and there have been for a very long time. And one of the interesting kind of keynotes in recovering my own ancestry was asking the question of what does it mean to be Irish? Who are the Irish? And when I started digging, you know, I realized that everybody that I know celebrates being Irish or the Irish people by celebrating St. Patrick's Day and wearing green. And it's like, oh yeah, Aaron go bra, let's go to the, you know, the Irish bar and drink Guinness and, you know, wear green and party and leprechauns, woo, right? And I was like, well, that's really fascinating. Like, who is St. Patrick? What is this about all of this? And as I dug into it, the story of St. Patrick is actually the story of someone who chased the snakes out of Ireland. And you start getting into that and you're like, what does he mean? What does this mean by chasing the snakes out of Ireland? Like, what is this actually about? And the more you dig, the more you realize that chasing the snakes out of Ireland was literally the victory of Christianity over the pagans. It was the destruction of the dragon peoples and the peoples that were the keepers of the ancient wisdom of the Irish, which is why no one understands what Irish is. And if you actually track back what Irish is, you end up you know, finding all of these tales that intersect with artifacts from the age of Avalon, which is very popularized you know, these days and, and mostly highly Christianized. When in fact, that period was actually where Christianity was coming in, trying to rewrite the stories of what was happening. The monks were telling the tales. And this is why a lot of the core history of this period was actually lost and why most scholars wonder if it's even true that some of these events occurred. However, all of the scholars looking at it, they're failing horribly at putting the pieces together because they are assuming instantly that the guy's birth name was Arthur and they're assuming he was a Christian. And so right there, they've already made a fallacy that this is not, you know, this has to be this way in order to explore this history. So if you keep going further, and I mentioned, you know, this period of Avalon because the name Pendragon, it's not Pendragon at all. Pendragon is an English distortion of the original Gaelic, which is actually Andragon. And Andragon means of the dragon. And so who we're actually dealing with here is someone more like Artur Andragon and the people of the dragon. And this is not probably a birth name at all. It's a title. And it's a title because of the carrying and the passage of what is known as Excalibur was, you know, the, the sword given to the leader who was in enough service to the people to carry the integrity of the old ways forward, to carry the, the piece of the sword and chalice, staff and stone. Now, that gets really interesting because you have this holy grail story and you've got this magical sword, right? But if you go further back, Excalibur was actually Caliburn before that. And if you keep going further back, the next time we hear about that same sword, is known as the Sword of Light of Nuada. And the Sword of Light of Nuada was said to have been brought by the Tuatha de Danann, who arrived in the British Isles riding clouds and who landed on the Iron Mountain and brought with them down from the Iron Mountain four sacred treasures from three islands in the sky. Sometimes it's said to be four islands, other Oh, and a translation say three, but in any essence, these four sacred tools are the sword of light of Nuada, the cauldron of the Dagda, which is essentially a bowl, which is said to be able to feed an army forever. Sounds like a replicator to me, i.e. gives eternal life, i.e. the grail, the sacred chalice, the origin story of the divine feminine chalice, which gives life forever. And even the spear, the spear of Lug, which was said to be able to be carried into battle and you would never lose, 
it became in Christianity's stories, the spear of destiny, the spear which pierced Jesus. You could never lose it going into battle. It's the same exact story. It's just, it actually came from the ancient Irish. And then finally, you have the stone of fall, which is a stone that was said to be able to control weather and also would sing whenever a new king arose. And so this is clearly a magical device of some kind or an advanced technology. And I believe that these were technologies brought by the Tuatha de Danann from another star system, which I believe was the Syrian star, star system, and that they as elves actually are the Syrians and that the roots of the elven stories as J.R.R. Tolkien tells them in The Lord of the Rings are actually stories about the Tuatha de Danann and this elven people who came from this other world to our planet. Now, how does all this relate with dragons? Well, interestingly, there's a thread that keeps going back. The people of the dragon, the people of the dragon, or the people of Danu, Tuatha de Danann, people of the Danu. And the Danu is not just a goddess representation, but is also connected to dragon goddess, like a Sophia representation. And as you pull this thread further, what you find is that there is this deep ancient galactic connection to dragons that's been here forever. And that if you go back in souls like mine and others, what we have is eventually a memory of being either with physical dragons in the Syrian star system and being dragon riders, where these physical incarnated beings, just like those that you see in a lot of the fantasy books and novels and that have been told stories about, were living creatures there and that were deeply, deeply honored and respected. And then if you go back even further, you get to an understanding that there are these dragon beings from the another galaxy, Andromeda, who came here to this galaxy because their genetics were stolen. And it was their stolen genetics that were used by the Arcturians to create the hybrids that we call reptilians. And this full story is actually in my book, The Dragon Key, which I'm just preparing to release and to launch. It'll be also web-based and audiobook-based, so you'll be able to explore it online. And I'm really excited to open that up to people very soon. So get on my list at adamapollo.com if you're interested in that. But it's been very important to me to help clarify these deep stories, to understand that it's not that even a traumatized species like the reptilians is not innately evil. It's that the, the acts that were used even to create that species were dishonorable. And this is what created this major pain and this reconciliation process that needed to happen. And it's the whole reason that dragons like me and others came to this galaxy to try to stop the onslaught of our brothers who were so angry that they wanted to destroy the people in this galaxy. And there became this very interesting interplay of guardians versus those that had lost their understanding of why and who they really are. And so are just acting out of trauma and acting out of recurring trauma and pain and war. And so, you know, we guardians are here and have been here for a long time to stand for the truth and the great reconciliation and the great healing. And I believe that healing is the dragon key. It's the key to understanding this place of pain and trauma inside of us that has the ability to be reconciled into its truth and liberated into its bliss so that we can truly know who we are as beings and move into the next step of our soul development. That's an amazing history. And um, I have to say, I have connected with the Andromeda Galaxy and the dragon beings and mm -hmm. see myself being one of the dragon riders, so I know mm -hmm. personally what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And um, it makes me curious as well, you know, if the dragons have so much influence, what other species have that kind of influence here on Earth as well? I mean, everybody knows about the mm -hmm. reptilians, but what about the whales and the dolphins and uh, yeah. mermaids and even leprechauns? I mean, when I went to Ireland, I connected actually very much with the leprechaun energies. So what other influences do we have coming in from the galactics right now? There's so many influences on this planet from many, many worlds. I mean, if you talk with any indigenous elders and they're willing to be honest with you, they'll tell you about how their culture is connected to Star Nation. And if you go to the Maori, for example, of New Zealand, they talk a lot about their connection with the Pleiades and the wisdom of the cetaceans, the dolphins and the whales. 
and how the connection with the whales and the dolphin beings and the star nation, i.e. the Pleiadian star nation that they're from, is one way to reconnect their worlds together and to bring a sense of wholeness and understanding of what real peace is about on the planet. And so, you know, cetaceans, dolphins, and whales are not just on Earth. They're in other worlds as well. And from my investigations into the Pleiadian star system, it's clearly the home planet. One of the main home planets around the star Maya is a water planet. And Maya very much as a name of a star clearly refers to a mother, a place of birthing, you know, the womb of, of life. And a water planet is obviously a womb of life in all kinds of fantastic and amazing ways. And so I know that a lot of these beings came from there. There's also clearly dolphins in the Syrian star system and that those dolphins came here to Earth probably with some augmentation tools, flying their own ships. And the Dogon tribe tell a story of them arriving and creating a pool of water and jumping into it and then floating up out of the water and telling them stories about this star system that they were from, which the Dogon then charted in their cave walls and were able to map the rotation of Sirius A and Sirius B, which are two stars, by the way, for those of you that seem to have the idea that you're from Sirius A or you're from Sirius B. No, those are stars. So like you would basically be being born on a star, which is going to cook you real quick. But you're most likely from a star system, meaning you're from the planet in between Sirius A and Sirius B. Imagine if Jupiter was a full star, right? We'd be in that kind of situation here. Is that Sirius C? Or no, what? Sirius C would also be a star. Um, and there's some postulation that there's a third, you know, a third brown star in that constellation or in that binary system. But if it is, it's probably like Jupiter. It's a brown dwarf kind of size, almost ignited, but not quite. And it seems pretty clear that, you know, there's a sustainable balance between this binary star system and its orbital rotation such that it would be very easy for a planetary system to exist there. It would just be daytime almost all the time in that planetary system. And we can see threads of that story even in Tolkien's work, who literally, he wanted to create a new language. He was a linguist. He knew like eight languages and he starts creating a new language and he starts having dreams and memories of the people that spoke that language. And he literally starts to channel the stories of the elven peoples which, by the way, are people from a land of eternal sun who crossed the great seas to come to Middle Earth to connect with these other species here and races, which I mean, almost viscer, like almost directly says they're from a dual sun system where it's daytime almost all the time, eternal sun, and they cross the great seas of space to come to Earth, you know? So you can find all of these data collaborations and confirmations for these things. Anyway, I think I got off track because the leprechauns, the huli huli people, the little people of many, many different cultures around the world, there's definitely been a small leprechaun-like small species that has been all over on this planet in Hawaii and, you know, in Asia, in Thailand, in you know, the British Isles, et cetera. There, there's 50 different words for fey beings and elven beings in Danish culture. And so you know that there's been these different, many, many different kinds of beings that have been here. Um, mermaids, of course, there have been legends about mermaids forever. Well, there's also all kinds of connections to the mermaid stories with the Pleiadian system and references to the Pleiades as like the sisters and the pools where the mermaids and mer people came from. Um, and if there was a water planet there, that would make perfect sense. So uh, it's stitching together these pieces of our galactic connection and galactic history has been one of my personal deep joys because it's really fun to see how all of the puzzle pieces fit together. And it's also been, you know, uh, driven a little bit by the recognition that there's so many stories told that are not complete, you know, that they have a part of the truth, but not the whole picture, you know, or misassociate species with certain places and certain worlds. And a lot of that just happens by accident. It's just assumptions made after having a powerful experience. 
But I think that when you consistently make contact, consistently have powerful experiences over and over and over again, and you do the diligence of the research to line it up and figure out what fits with historical narratives and with the indigenous people's narratives and with you know the stories of our people here on this planet, then the puzzle starts to get really clear. And that you know Earth is absolutely a melting pot of not just galactic beings into humanity, but many different kinds of species and beings that have incarnated and choose to live here. Just one clarifying piece. So sure. you seem to define the star and the star system differently. And you mentioned that mm. when people say that they're from Sirius A, Sirius B, or whatever, just explain that a little bit. What do you mean by that? Well, you know, when you say that you're from Earth, you don't say that you're from the sun, right? So if you said, I'm from the sun, then... I would wonder like, okay, cool. So maybe you're like an astral being, like just hanging out on the star itself, right? Or are you an incarnated being? Like, did you actually incarnate into a body and eat and grow and live and interact with other bodies in the physical world? If so, then you probably incarnated on a planet that's enough distance from your star that it wasn't getting baked <laughs> and that you actually could have you know, the wetware of a body and flesh and blood and all of these kinds of things. So yeah, that's what I mean is that, you know, the Syrian star system has two stars in it. And those two stars are as hot and blazing and, you know, giant fusion engines, a nuclear explosion that never stops, just like our star is not a great place to grow up. But the planetary system around the star absolutely might have places that you can grow up in. And, you know, around stars in their star system, you have planets, as we know now, 99.9% .9 of all stars have planetary systems around them. That's the current scientific narrative. And we now believe that over half of all stars are likely to have a planet that's around the Goldilocks zone, which is not too hot, not too cold, perfect for life. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we just happen to be right here right now on this beautiful spherical planet hurtling around the sun, traveling around the galaxy that just happens to be in the right spot, just far enough from the sun with a beautiful moon that helps balance our whole emotional bodies and waveforms keeps the tides going, keeps the cycles moving, keeps menstruation happening and life birthing. And, you know, we, we got lucky. We won one of the awards and we got the sweet spot. And many other worlds have the same thing. But I, when I talk about galactic species, if I'm going to say species, I'm going to be talking about a physical being incarnated on another planet that developed, has a biosphere, has qualities and physical form. I'm just not as interested in the astral beings out there that are non-physical because there's literally infinite variations of those. And because it's astral, it's mental, which means you can mentally construct and make up whatever kinds of beings you want. You can create chimera out of your own dreams and imagination, and you can interact with them like they're real in your dream world, but it doesn't mean they're actually independent beings that live and grow and develop and have a psyche and have an experience and have joy and pain and love and all of the things and that are actually here to be in relationship with you in this world. And those beings that have that physical characteristic and quality, would you say they exist in the third dimension like us or is there variability in that? But dimensionality is another majorly misunderstood topic in these areas. I mean, for example, you know, if you just look at our experience, we are changing through time every moment. I'm not in the moment that I just was in, but I can look back and I can look at what I just said a minute ago about a star or about star systems or Sirius or whatever. And because I'm capable of doing that, I have literally fourth dimensionally moved from where I was a minute ago to right here, right now. And by the way, I'm hurtling a thousand miles an hour eastward on a rotating planet that's traveling at 64,000 kilometers or miles. It's, I think it's kilometers an hour around the sun, right? And the sun is hurtling through the galaxy, <laughs> you know? So we're moving constantly right now. And 
understanding that and understanding that all that we're experiencing requires three dimensions and four dimensions. Like you literally don't have experience without that. And if you're talking about a fifth dimensional perspective or being, all you're talking about is someone who's now fully aware of all the aspects of the three dimensions and the fourth dimension and are now perceiving the patterns through time that are occurring within those four dimensions. Because you're actually looking at it more from the outside. You're like, okay, I was this in another lifetime. Now I am this now. There's a connection and there's a synchronicity between what happened a month ago and what's happening today. You're seeing the patterns through time. And so you're also more astutely aware and observing that there is a sort of divine beauty and patterning unfolding through our experience in time. Now, that's not also the limit of dimensionality. You can see from a sixth dimensional level, seventh dimensional level, take into account patterns in the 5D, patterns in the 6D. And these are just layers or awareness levels of consciousness. That's all. That doesn't, if you go up in dimensions, you never lose the prior dimensions. It doesn't work that way. It encompasses the prior dimension. 3D encompasses two dimensional planes. 2D encompasses one dimensional lines through time, right? So the whole idea that if you go 5D, you know, you're just leaving to a new world and everybody else is going in a separate world. All of that is a bunch of total BS. I'm sorry. It's total BS. By very definition, that theory doesn't hold because 5D is a unified field. So when people say that, I'm like, exactly. where do I begin? (laughs) Exactly. It's like, I'm sorry, 3D versus 5D. Like if you even are articulating it that way, It shows completely your ignorance on dimensionality. And also, unfortunately, it also shows your ignorance around consciousness itself because you're not operating in a way where you understand that a higher dimensional view embraces and encompasses everything inside of it, meaning that you have to actually come to accept your own shadow and your own fear and your own sense of division of like, I'm going to be with the good guys and the bad guys are all going to just evaporate or go to hell. Like I'm going to escape on an enlightened world and everybody else is just going to go poof and I don't have to worry about them anymore. Sorry, that's not actually how spiritual development works. You have to realize they are you and they are your people. Every child matters. Every person matters. Every It doesn't even matter. If it's a guy in the cabal, guess what? Your hate of this person is absolutely 100% going to karmically reflect on you and your own journey. You have to actually come to love even the people that are the fullest darkness, the the most evil. And that is actually what, you know, Christ has been trying to teach people for thousands of years. Hello. It's like, love thy enemy. Where did we miss that part? Come on, New Agers. We got this. We got this. <laughs> well, I, I, love, I love that you brought that up because that's what I've been saying for years as well. And I'm curious because mm. I do think some people will choose not to continue. So I, I do think some people will leave by choice, but not because they're being banished off into some other dimension for being bad, you know? So I think right. we need to make that very important distinction right there. Yeah. Well, and choosing to continue is, you know, is just a matter of perspective. It's like the guy who is raised by, you know, who knows, farmer dad who like beat him growing up. And the only way he could get out was by acting out enough that he had to join the military. He got conditioned into the military, realized the horrors of war, comes back and and is like a wounded veteran, can't even get a job except for at McDonald's, right? And do you think that person wants the conditions of life that they're in? Like, and because they may not be conscious of what you're conscious of, do they deserve those conditions of life? Well, of course not. We live in a systemic process where there's all this trauma. And the reality is that when a veteran like that goes through a trauma healing and actually is given a new sense of purpose, planetary stewardship, leadership, the ability to to make change or to make the world a better place. Oh my God, they are the most dedicated person you can imagine to that. So you bring in new kinds of culture, you bring in Starfleet, you bring in 
you know, where we can actually go and how do we actually manage this planet, those people, a hundred percent, they're going to quit that job at McDonald's, you know, the second there's a new chance, a new opportunity that can take them into greater purpose and greater vocation. And I believe that's true for many of the homeless people out there. I've had so many conversations with homeless people that because of the way the structure of the system is, they prefer being homeless than playing the games inside of the system. It, the system's so broken, they would rather be homeless and begging on the street than to be cogs in some of the corporate wheels that they had been a part of prior. And for people like that, they are simply just seeking a new path to their purpose. And if that new path can be constructed, I believe we will see a massive change on this planet. And that's a big part of my work with Core Nexus. Beautiful. I love it. Thank you so much, Adam, for sharing your amazing story and your perspectives. Of course. I would love for you to just give our audience some final parting words for people who are, you know, maybe aspiring or still finding that purpose. What can you say to them? I would say that your purpose isn't found in anything outside of you. It's actually found in the core of who you are. And that when you're given the space, you give yourself the space and the time to do the work, the deep inquiry, to find yourself inside and to start remembering, to start healing, to start accepting all the things that you've been through in your life. The more you accept from the past, the clearer the path to your future becomes. And accepting ourselves is the key to healing. It's the key to transformation. And sometimes we have really hard lives. I've had a really, really hard life in a lot of ways, but I've been extraordinarily blessed throughout my life because I've been willing to accept the hardest parts. I've been willing to accept myself. I've been willing to accept that I'm not perfect. I've been willing to accept that I've made mistakes. I've been willing to accept that I've been off in myself, in my journey from where I truly wanted to be many times in my life. And the more I embraced those facets of me, the more I gained the capacity of my skills and my knowledge that I have. And for me, that extends not just in this life, but across all of my lifetimes. I have spent 25 years at this point, exploring my past lives and memories that I've had with other people and deep diving into the places where I've held karma and sanskaras, the pain, the traumas that I've been through, the wounds that I've been through, and through accepting myself and loving myself and allowing the healing to happen in those times, I have come into a deeper, clearer understanding of who I truly am and what I'm here to do than anything outside could ever tell me. No teacher, no guru, no guide, no master. The true master is the master within you. It's the one who's actually been on this journey this whole time and that has been through so much. And if you can just remember it and accept those parts of you, so many gifts will come forward and you will find that the path of your purpose is already being laid out in front of you like this beautiful divine pattern. And yeah, we need systems that can actually match that and meet that and support you in that journey. And I'm working on that. And many, many others are too. But the first step is finding yourself. It's finding who you really are. Thank you so much, Adam. What a beautiful message to finish on. Very inspiring. So everyone, if you want to find Adam, go to adamapollo.com. You'll find his amazing website work. You can go check out his story about the being in much more detail there as well. And if you like today's content, please give us those likes, shares, help spread the word about this amazing message. Our vision here at First Contact is open contact and intergalactic peace. So thank you, Adam, for joining us here today. It's been a pleasure. It's my pleasure and honor. Thank you so much. I look forward to connecting with you all again soon. Bye, everyone.